in with disturbing new information this morning about the man who shot and killed eight people at a Dallas area mall over the weekend. A social media page appearing to belong to Mauricio Garcia shared extremist beliefs with rants against Jews, women, and racial minorities. He also shared pictures on a Russian social networking site of the outlet mall where the attack took place, as well as this photo appearing to show the 33-year-old shirtless with multiple Nazi tattoos. A senior law enforcement source said that Garcia's social media activity is part of their investigation. Witnesses described the chaos and the confusion the moment the shooting began. There's this guy dressed in all black, wearing a vest, has an assault rifle, and he's just shooting at people. There was dead people on the floor. A lot of people, they were like, you know, hiding. And as I was going around, they told me to get away, you know, to move out. And I kept on telling them I'm looking for my daughter. This morning, we are also learning more about the victims, three of them children. They include a young boy and his parents, two elementary school age sisters, a security guard and an engineer. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in Allen, Texas, with the latest on the investigation. Hey, good morning from, as you can see, this growing memorial here in Allen, Texas. The outpouring of grief and support in this community just insurmountable. This days after Saturday's mass shooting, America's latest mass shooting here at this outlet mall. And also, this comes as senior law enforcement officials tell NBC News a series of posts from the alleged shooter, 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia, are a key part of their investigation into what led up to and what fueled the shooting. It largely, those posts coming from a Russian social media platform on which Garcia alluded to white power beliefs. He posted photos of his torso that appear to show white power tattoos, including a swastika tattoo. They say he ranted online about multiple minorities, about women, about Jews. And he also, they say, in the days leading up to this shooting, posted dozens of photos of this outlet mall. And they say he may have been monitoring it during its busiest times. Of course, as we tend to see in, wake, in the wake of these shootings, nationwide, statewide, a lot of conversations about gun control. Texas Republicans, including Governor Greg Abbott, Senator Ted Cruz, among those saying this is not about guns, this is about mental health. Of course, they're Democrat colleagues arguing that it is indeed about guns, and everybody kind of focusing in on that debate, as we tend to see, again, in the wake of these horrific events. And at the same time, of course, most importantly, we are learning far more about the eight innocent lives lost, including three young children from two separate North Texas families. The youngest three-year-old James Cho killed along with his parents, Cindy and Q. And law enforcement officials tell us his six-year-old brother, William, is the only member of the family to survive. He just turned six. The Mendoza family losing 11-year-old Daniela, 8-year-old Sofia, their mother in critical condition. Also among the victims, 32-year-old Elio Cumana Rivas, 26-year-old Ashwaria Tata Condia, and 23-year-old security guard Christian LaCour. And then finally, the last person that we want to highlight here is authorities say the police officer, who is the one who killed the shooter in the wake or in the midst of all of this gunfire, all of this panic. That officer was wounded, an attorney overnight speaking out about that officer, saying he is doing well, adding he's a brave servant with a gentle heart. Guys, I'll send it back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. In Washington today, top congressional leaders will meet with President Biden at the White House. They are hoping to reach an agreement to avoid a financial catastrophe. Yeah, but this morning, Democrats and Republicans are far apart on a deal to raise the debt ceiling. And the clock is ticking down to a critical deadline. Well, last week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned the U.S. could hit that ceiling and face potential severe economic consequences as soon as June 1st. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Hey, Mike. So tell us, what can we expect from today's meeting? and also remind us here of the stakes if they don't reach a deal. The White House recently laid out really a grim scenario if the debt ceiling isn't raised and the U.S. defaults on its debts. Walk us through that. Yeah, Savannah, I mean, we've had these kinds of crisis moments in Washington before where both sides go to the brink but ultimately get a deal. I've never seen one quite like this where no one quite sees the path to a deal. And frankly, they head into this meeting disagreeing on even what the meeting is about. President Biden, the White House, saying that he still says Congress has to pass a clean debt limit increase. In other words, just pass it without any spending conditions attached. And there's just over three weeks for them to reach a deal. Now, the White House raising the stakes by laying out what would happen under a range of scenarios. The worst case scenario, a protracted 
debt default would lead to more than 8 million jobs lost. The stock market could lose uh, potentially half of its value. A shorter term crisis would lead to the loss of about half a million jobs. But consider this, even if they reach a deal, but only at the last minute, you're still talking about the loss of 200,000 jobs. Just to put that into context, last month, we just got last week the, the jobs report from last month and we gained 250,000 jobs in the last month. So you're talking about a month's worth of job gains wiped out even if they get a deal on time. And so that's mm -hmm. why the tone that the leaders express coming out of this meeting will be so important. Do they indicate that there might be a path to deal or are they still far apart on what they're even talking about? Mm -hmm. So Mike, this is gonna be House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's first face-to-face -face meeting with the president since February. Two weeks ago, House Republicans did pass their debt ceiling plan, but it's tied to deep spending cuts. That's a non-starter for the president and congressional Democrats. I, I know you cover the White House, but you keep close tabs on Congress as well. I mean, does McCarthy have room to maneuver in these negotiations at all? You look at what the House Republicans passed just a few weeks ago, their answer to the debt ceiling deal, it, it would have lead to about $4.5 trillion in spending cuts over the next 10 years. It would also lift that debt ceiling for a short-term basis. The Speaker was only able to pass that by one single vote. And we remember it took him 15 votes to secure the Speakership. And interestingly, the Republicans who voted against that deal uh, just a few weeks ago, they weren't the moderate members who were worried about those spending cuts being too high. They were the you know, right-wing base who said it, mm. said it didn't go far enough. So when you have the president talking about $3 trillion in spending reductions over the next 10 years, Republicans talking about more than $4.5 trillion, you might say, let's just split the difference. But McCarthy is under enormous pressure from that uh, right-wing base in his caucus to not budge an inch. And that's why it's a really dicey moment for him as well. And Mike, I know the president's expected to be here in New York on Wednesday. He's going to take his message on the debt ceiling to a region represented by GOP House members. What's that strategy? Yeah, I'll be coming up there for that. You know that. And <laughs> it's interesting because there are 18 congressional districts that elected a Republican last November in the midterms. But these districts also voted for President Biden in 2020. So that's your definition of a swing district and the president's going to one mm -hmm. of them. It's represented by Mike Lawler. He voted for that GOP spending bill uh, just in the last couple of weeks. And Republicans like him have been targeted by the White House and by Democratic allies for what those cuts would mean to their constituents. So the president's gonna go to his district to make that case himself, talking about what it would mean for especially veterans care. There's a VA hospital near his district. This is about really two different things. The president, one, wants to see if he can put pressure on McCarthy by putting pressure on him not from the right wing end of his base, uh, but from the moderates in his caucus, but also to really lay down a marker that when the elections come in 2024, these are the really target districts Democrats will go after first and foremost. And so they want to lay the groundwork for potentially unseating them so Democrats have a shot at winning back the House. And Mike, we are preparing for your visit. We have the green M&Ms ready, the perfectly chilled water, all as requested. So Car you know what that I picks you up. You're going to be good. It. You know, let's, perfect. 68 what? degrees. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a last thing we'll ask you here. I mean, for Speaker McCarthy, if he can't reach a deal with the White House, then what? Are there any other options here? Well, we're really in this moment talking about sort of hail mary scenarios. One is a so-called discharge petition. What that really looks like is Democrats would be able to force a vote on the House floor on a so-called clean increase if they can get maybe five, six, seven Republicans to support this. Uh, Congressman from North Carolina, Democrat Jeff Jackson, yesterday, he said, this is actually McCarthy's dream scenario. If this happened, he would complain like heck publicly, say this was a terrible thing, but privately he would be saying, Thank goodness, because this would get him out of an impossible situation with his base. On the White House end of things, there's this talk of the 14th Amendment option. This would really let the president say, I can raise the debt limit on my own without Congress. Even his own administration, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying this weekend, she doesn't want to entertain those kinds of emergency options. There's a lot of legal uncertainty that would be raised if mm. he took that path. All right, Mike, we will certainly be talking to you about this throughout the week. Thank you so much. We have new developments this morning in that deadly crash along the Texas border that killed eight people. The driver of that vehicle, George Alvarez, is now facing manslaughter charges, but police are still looking into a possible motive. Now, cities along the border are bracing for a new wave of migrants when a COVID-era immigration policy expires later this week. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us with the latest. Good morning, Julia. So first of all, where do things stand in the investigation into the driver and a possible motive? 
Well, Joe, it's really complicated. We actually don't have as many answers at this point as we thought we might. But yes, they know that the, they've identified the driver as George Alvarez. But investigators told us yesterday that he's not cooperating. They actually haven't been able to talk to him as much as they would like to. He has a very long history, a very long criminal history, including assault with a deadly weapon, threatening elders, people in his family. Uh, this is someone who definitely has a track record here, but so far not cooperating. Also, so far, the charge is manslaughter but they haven't ruled out other charges that could come when they find out the motive. Because of that context here, Title 42 lifting, a surge of migrants down in Brownsville. I was just there on Friday when 2,300 migrants crossed just that morning. Because of that surge, a lot of people thought maybe this might be anti-immigrant motivated. But right now, we just don't have those answers. They're charging him with manslaughter after he ran a large SUV into that group of migrants standing at a bus stop. Joe. You know, one of the reasons this investigation is complicated, authorities, say is because some of the victims were migrants. What more can you tell us about that aspect of the investigation? Yeah, beyond just the fact that George Alvarez isn't cooperating, a lot of the witnesses may have, uh, some of them have had some anecdotes, some things that they've said about the scene that haven't been corroborated by police. That's also been confusing just from a reporting perspective. And they also say that sometimes it's hard to talk to these victims because you ha and the people who were there and witnesses because you also have to work with their government, many of them Venezuelan. That's a tough task. Here's what they had to say about that yesterday. It, it has been a, a very tiresome process, but one that we are deeply committed to doing and accomplishing. We are working with the Venezuelan government right now, and we have also reached out to other embassies. And of course, it's very difficult for the U.S. government often, or people in the United States to work with the Venezuelan government. They're not notoriously cooperative with Americans, um, but they are going to continue this process as they try to piece together what exactly happened and especially what George Alvarez may have said at the time of the scene and what his demeanor may have been like if he had any anti-immigrant rhetoric as he approached this bus stop or after, they would want to know that. And of course, Julia, this all comes with Title 42 set to expire in two days on Thursday. Remind us again what that policy is and the strain that all this is really putting on border communities like Brownsville. That's right. So Title 42 is a COVID-19 restrictions that have turned migrants away more than 2.5 million times before they could claim asylum when they cross the southern border. Because that national COVID emergency is lifting, that means at 11.59 p.m. on May 11th, so really looking at May 12th, more migrants will be able to cross and be able to claim asylum. However, some policies have changed. The Biden administration has put new restrictions in place to raise the bar on what exactly migrants will need to prove in order to come into the United States. But what I've learned from a lot of border agents when I was down there last week is that really what they're expecting is an increase in processing times as they determine who can stay and who can't. That could lead to backlogs at the border already in cities like El Paso, where I'm going just about to head down there later today. I'm told as many as 2,000 are sleeping on the street, many of those unprocessed because they're able Able to cross before Border Patrol even interacts with them because Border Patrol is already stretched so thin. They're $3 billion in the hole. They need more funding from Congress for this. And right now, it looks like those border communities are going to be the ones bearing the brunt of this surge. All right. Safe travels today, Julia. Thank you, as always, for your reporting. And what's happening at the border is being felt across the country. For several months, southern states have been sending busloads of migrants north to places like New York City. Now, Mayor Eric Adams is trying to relocate some of those migrants to surrounding suburbs. But those towns are pushing back. NBC News Now correspondent Valerie Castro has the latest. The migrant crisis spilling over from the border, now pitting some of the suburbs of New York against the city. It's a farce, and it will not happen on our watch. Local leaders declaring a state of emergency and criticizing Mayor Eric Adams for announcing a program to send several hundred migrants to two counties outside of New York City. Rockland is not going to stand idly by while your administration, which boasts itself as a sanctuary city, diverts busloads of undocumented individuals to our county. The city's plan, which it says could be expanded, is for single men to be housed at local hotels for up to four months. The county social services director says Mayor Adams didn't give them a choice. And it was not a question, could we? It was, you will. Uh, these people are coming. And again, not a lot of information. Uh, not time frames other than it's imminent. This hotel in Orangetown, one of the planned sites where the town's Republican supervisor says they were given little notice. 
absolutely blindsided. Teresa Kenny sharing this photo of mattresses outside the hotel as it prepared for the buses, describing an interaction with a hotel employee who said he was instructed to take queen beds out of rooms and put two twin beds in 60 to 70 rooms. The town saying such boarding is not the intended use of the hotel, issuing a formal notice to the business, citing a change of occupancy violation. WNBC was on site but unable to get a comment from the hotel and Rockland County declaring a state of emergency. For the next 30 days, that state of emergency will prohibit other municipalities from bringing and housing people in the county and prohibit hotels and motels from housing immigrants without a license. Eric Adams calling the move a forced undertaking, saying the program is part of the city's compassionate response and adding it will provide migrants with temporary housing, access to services and connections to local communities as they build a stable life. He's trying to balance the logistical and humanitarian challenges with the national political debate and has even been critical of President Biden. Why are you doing this to New York? The national government has turned its back on New York City. And New York isn't the only city dealing with the issue. The suburban send-off also played out in Chicago last year. The village of Burr Ridge receiving dozens of migrants in September to the surprise of the mayor. I still have not gotten an official word from the city. Grosso telling us Mayor Lightfoot is doing to him what Greg Abbott did to her. She never said she'd be sending them out to the suburbs. Back in New York. They're, they're trying to destroy the suburbs. And at least this county executive thinks it's just the beginning. The city of New York right now is on the edge of making things much, much worse. Our thanks to Valerie for that report. Well, the program is starting with several hundred people. The government expects that number to grow when Title 42 expires later this week. As far as who pays for it, New York City says it will foot the bill for shelter, plus three meals a day, along with health care, laundry, and more. Well, this morning, the New York City jury is scheduled to begin deliberations in the civil rape case against former President Donald Trump. Writer E. Jean Carroll is accusing Trump of battery and defamation, stemming from an allegation that he raped her in a department store back in the mid-90s. Carroll came forward with the allegation, which the former president has continued to deny, in 2019. Kristen gibbons Fedden joins us now. She's an NBC News legal analyst, as well as a civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. Kristen, good morning. Thanks for being here. So let's start with close arguments that we heard from Donald Trump's lawyer, Joe Tacopina. What were the main points he made? The main points he made is that he argued that Carol's claim was an affront to justice, and those are the exact words that he used. And he basically highlighted that there was no objective evidence to really corroborate her allegations. He also pointed out that Carol was not able to recall the exact date of the alleged rape, and he questioned how Trump could even bring up a defense or an alibi if he couldn't even combat the fact that there was no date. He also argued the, uh, the significance of no police report and really questioned Carol's credibility. And I think one of the most effective things that he did was that he gave the jury or illustrated in his closing that the jury could both think that Trump was crude based on those Hollywood access tapes as well as his combative demeanor within the deposition excerpts that were played and still find Carol not credible. And Carol's lawyers, I, I want to play something that they had played, a specific part of Trump's deposition for the jury to hear referencing that infamous Access Hollywood tape. Let's watch that quickly. And you say, and again, this has become very famous in this video, I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. Just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the You can do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what it's... If you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. So, Kristen, again, just to be clear for our audience, that was part of a taped deposition that was then played. We did not see the former president actually on the stand or anything like that. Do we know, though, how playing that specific part of the deposition could play into the plaintiff's strategy here? Yeah, I think it actually plays in two crucial ways. Because keep in mind that Carol is suing both for defamation as well as for um, assault and battery, so the rape. So with regard to um, the defamation claim, she was able, uh, Carol's attorney was able to argue that 
Trump is, um, this was part of his MO. He was assaulting her in the same manner that he assaulted other women. And it worked beautifully with regard to the other act um, evidence, those other two women who said that he assaulted her in the same way. But then when she showed that Access Hollywood, as well as with the other um, aspect of the deposition where he mistakenly identified uh, Carol as his former wife, she was able to then show putting those together, that Carol was exactly Trump's type and that he was going to take her and rape her in exactly the way that he identified in that Access Hollywood tape. So you mentioned the fact that defamation is part of this. So there is, there's defamation as well as battery. Those are these two things here. It's not just this alleged rape. How difficult historically are either of those two things to prove here? What's it going to take? It is very difficult. Defamation is really difficult um, for many reasons, but essentially you have to prove uh, the falsity of statements. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like counterintuitive. Similarly, um, sexual assault crimes and uh, liability are also very difficult to prove just because it's he said, she said. But I think in this case, and I have tried these cases over and over throughout the entirety of my career, it's the mountain of evidence that really helps to bolster the credibility of the survivor. And in this case, I think the plaintiff did a great job doing so. Mm. Kristen Gibbons fed and thank you so much. It's looking like a rainy Tuesday for parts of the country. Let's get a check on your morning news now forecast. Andrew Lassman joins us now and is tracking those storms this morning. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys. We've got a couple of showers working through parts of the Mid-Atlantic and along the East Coast. We've even got some shower activity through parts of the Plains. But it's down through Texas that we're really going to keep a close eye on over the next couple of days for heavy rounds of rain, multiple rounds of rain that lead to the potential for some flooding. Here's the, the rainfall amounts that we'll expect. You can see this goes up into parts of the Plains. We'll get a couple of inches into places like Bismarck, Denver, but near the Houston area, specifically the Houston metro, we could see upwards of five inches of rain through at least the next couple of days. This is the area that we're looking at for the flooding concern. It does go into parts of Little Rock, Shreveport, into Mississippi and extending out east. We'll see uh, maybe a quarter of an inch or a half an inch of rain over the next few days. But specifically, the Houston metro area is where we'll watch for that moderate risk for flash flooding at least through the day today. The saturated soils, they've already had recent rainfall, and we could see rainfall rates pretty impressive, two and a half inches per hour. So that's the reason that we're looking at uh, some concern for flooding in that area. But that's not the only thing we have to watch for today. We also have five million people at risk for some severe weather. It's in two locations. The first is out towards the Carolinas. We have North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, all included in this. We'll look for the better potential for some of those stronger storms, though, to be centered into parts of the plains. There will that will include Wichita, Oklahoma City. And we're mainly looking at the risk for some large hail. We're talking baseball size that does include Salina, Dodge City, but also Wichita, Blackwell, Tulsa included in uh, one inch hail as well. And if you're paying attention tomorrow too, we'll have that severe risk centered mainly close to the Rockies. Denver included in that, Cheyenne, Casper, as we look for once again a day of afternoon, uh, strong wind gusts, maybe some damaging hail, and even a couple of tornadoes here uh, as we get into the afternoon and evening hours tomorrow. But how about those temperatures across the southeast? Boy, it's way warmer than normal. Little Rock is headed to the 90s today. Kansas City is headed to the low 80s. Amarillo will hit 94 degrees this afternoon. And it's tomorrow, too, for parts of the Midwest, ending up into the upper 70s in Chicago, upper 70s for Minneapolis. And these numbers are, are above normal for this time of year. And it goes through the weekend for parts of New York, guys. We are headed to the low 80s. It'll be a, a quite a nice weekend ahead. Another mm -hmm. outdoor brunch weekend. There you go. Right, here we go. <laughs> great. Yeah, very exciting. Thanks, All right, Angie. Angie. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.